type them in the chat box, okay? Um, I, I'm really excited, guys. Like I said, uh, Brian, and I'm going to butcher your last name, Brian, but De, De Brower, is that correct? That's actually pretty good. All right. Uh, you know, he's been, I've been following him, and he's been uh, posting a lot of great stuff that I share on our page uh, with videos and mechanics. And I know when I, I talk to many of you guys, um, you know, you guys uh, kind of wanted, uh, you know, mechanics. And what do we do on, you know, steel plays? What do we focus on? And, and, and you guys are really going to, um, you know, enjoy. Brian has been great just following him on social media. I'm really excited to have him with us. Um, so, Brian, I think Dana made you host. Uh, yeah. So you can share, or if you have videos and stuff like that, you can kind of control everything. Yeah. Uh, guys, if you guys have questions, just put them in the chat box. Uh, let's get Brian get through his presentation. We'll, we'll fire questions at him here as we go. Um, I will facilitate the questions to him, and then he'll he'll answer them just to keep everything flow and – uh, so we don't have madness on here tonight. So, uh, guys, uh, again, uh, Brian, thank you. And uh, like we start with our guest, if you can just kind of tell us a little bit about your umpiring career, uh, how you started, where you're at now, and uh, you know, and then uh, get going with your presentation. Yeah, great. Um, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I heard great things about your time uh, with our guys working the travel ball stuff. So. Um, I'm glad that we could kind of parlay that into, into this, this, uh, this event. But for me particularly, um, I started umpiring as a 14 year old. I was one of those kids that just, you know, said, Oh, I can make some extra money on the weekends. Let me go grab the balloon and that nasty face mask that they would keep in the, the little shit, you know, um, area behind the plate. And I'll, I'll put that on and start working. And so, I did that all through high school and um, kind of took a break from umpiring when I was in college. And then when I got, uh, when I graduated from school and started working a real job, I kind of wanted some outlet for myself other than sitting at a desk. And um, I thought I'd get back into umpiring and I had moved to a different area of the country. And so the person that I then got involved with, with, with umpiring was, much more serious than I had ever been about it before. And so he had some experience. He went to one of the Jim Evans clinics. Um, and so, you know, he was far from an expert, but he was, he was well-schooled and he took pride in teaching his new umpires. And so that kind of got me started on the right foot, learning the basics, um, things that we're, we're going to talk a little bit about tonight, like proper use of eyes and you know, how to use the slot and, and stuff like that. Um, and fast forward to now, 15, 20 years later, and I'm a former AAA umpire. I did seven years in minor league baseball. Um, I finished in AAA and was asked not to come back like so many of us are. Um, but that's kind of always the most likely outcome that we're prepared for. So you give it your best shot. And if they like you, they like you. If they don't, they don't. And um, the nice thing about it, about the professional experience is that you can kind of parlay that usually into some success in the amateur umpiring world. And so I've been lucky enough to jump in with United umpires as an instructor, um, and also working myself, um, in a couple different conferences around the country. Um, and so I'm keeping myself pretty busy on the field and then, with our clinic season and, you know, extending that basically to all year at this point with videos and uh, trying to pump out as much content as we can. So um, for those of you who aren't specifically familiar, I'd suggest going on Facebook and checking out United Umpires. That's, that's our, um, our main hub. You'll find tons of content, tons of videos. Um, go back into the library and you'll see stuff from, major league umpires, minor league umpires, um, all over the map. So anyway, um, that's enough about me. Let's talk about some umpiring. I wanted to talk about a million different things. I mean, shoot, we could go all around the field and spend hours talking about, you know, God knows what topics, but obviously I want to maximize your guys' time. Um, but 
not shortchange you on any on any particular topic. So the way we try to teach is we don't just say do this. We say here's why we want to do this and here's a way that you'll find yourself making a mistake in this situation so that you can recognize here's the advice we're giving you and here's what the mistake looks like so that when it happens you can be ready to correct it because the reality for amateur umpires is most of the games you work you're not going to have someone there telling you what to do better um Maybe you're lucky enough to work with some partners that you can trust and, and you'll talk about things and um, you'll get good feedback. But a lot of games, you just go back to the car, slam your trunk and hit the road. So you need to be your own, your own supervisor, so to speak. So we're trying to give you tools to, to train yourself, really. Um, so we don't, talk, we don't talk a lot about specific stuff. We talk about kind of general ideas that then hopefully you can apply to your umpiring. So let's, let's get into some of that stuff. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. And you should all be seeing, and I'm just going to keep this in kind of uh, without going into presentation mode. So hopefully you can see common mistakes on the screen right now. Hector, at least give me, a, give me a thumbs up so you know that's what you're seeing. All right, cool. So I wanted to talk about some common mistakes that we see in the two umpire system. And, and that would of course bleed into the three umpire system and, and beyond, but you know, work in the two umpire system that most of us work all, all the time. What are some common mistakes? So first one, locking in on either the ball or the runner. Um, I'm hoping that the phrase, uh, watch the ball glance at the runners, um, is, is something that we're all familiar with, but let's, let's talk about how that actually works on a specific play. So, um, we're in the A position. We're, um, working the bases from the A position and there's a base hit to the outfield. What we tend to see is an umpire running to the infield, staring at the batter runner all the way up the first baseline, watching that runner progress all the way up the baseline. Well, what, let's think about what's important about the batter runner. The batter runner becomes important when, when he or she is about to touch first base. That's the moment that the batter runner becomes important to us. So prior to the batter runner touching first base, we want to see what's going on with the baseball because the status of the baseball is what drives the play, right? If the ball gets past the outfielder and we don't know that because we've been staring at the batter runner, we're now operating without all of the information that we need on a given play. So we want to watch the ball and glance at runners, but not just that, we also want to know what's going on with our partner. And one of the traps that we fall into in the two umpire system is we don't know where our partner is on the field because we put blinders on it. So really what I'm talking about is anytime there's a possible rotation, any rotation situation, I want the base umpire to not just listen for the partner coming up to, to third base, but to turn and look to look at their partner and make sure that they're on their way to third base early in the play. And that way, when you get to the three umpire system, you'll have practiced this art of checking your partners because that's one of the significant deficiencies we see in new three man umpires is knowing what your partners are doing. So when you're out there working in the two umpire system and you're in the middle, you're working the B or C position, and the ball gets hit to the outfield, when you have that moment where there's not anything important to watch, so there's not a catch that's happening or a touch of a base or possible obstruction, turn and look at your partner to see that they're on their way towards third base, if, if that's what the, the situation calls for. Um, so the other mistake that we see here is we don't look at the runner at the appropriate time. So um, let's say we're starting a, a situation in the B position and the ball gets hit to the outfield. Now we tend to kind of zero in on the ball and we forget about the runner that's rounding first base. Well, that runner might be thinking about going to second. So we're watching the ball, but then we're glancing back at the runner until we know what that runner's intentions are. So 
collect all this information and understand what it is we're trying to get out of seeing each, each thing. What's going on with the ball? Is it being fielded cleanly? Did it get to the cutoff cleanly? All right, those are the important pieces of information with the ball. With the runner, we're checking to see base touches, obstruction, and their intent to either stop or continue. So until you know that that runner is, is set on stopping or is definitely gonna continue, you should continue to glance back and make sure you know what that runner is doing. And that's one, of the, that's one of the serious issues we see. Guys get stuck watching one thing and they forget to glance back over and check, and check something else. All right, um, of, of all the things I've seen uh, dealing with, and I've been kind of running some clinics in my area since I've been stuck at home and we have some travel baseball going on. This second item here, this uh, improper use of eyes, this is the, I'll put it over there, that was unintentional, but we'll just call it a uh, happy accident. Um, this is the most, the most uh, significant issue that I've seen from, from umpires, you know, working the travel ball or the low level high school, or even, you know, high school, like uh, full, full fledged varsity high school umpires, improper use of eyes. Okay. So if you don't remember anything else from this call tonight, remember the term proper use of eyes. What are we talking about when we're talking about proper use of eyes? Well, it differs from situation to situation, but essentially it means watching the play, whatever it is that we're judging through to its completion before we make up our mind. So let's start here with catches, catches in the outfield. What we tend to see is the ball hits the leather and we make a decision. And sometimes that comes in the form of a catch signal. Sometimes it's a point guys, you know, like the point at catches in the outfield. Sometimes it's telling our partner, if you're the plate umpire, right? You say, that's a catch. Well, a lot of guy, a lot of umpires like to say, boom, that's a catch. Well, is it a catch yet? When the ball touches the leather, is it a catch yet? It is not, right? What do we need? We need firm and secure possession, some sort of demonstration of voluntary release that differs from level to level. In professional baseball, it's the act of opening the glove. In college baseball, it's the free hand moving towards the glove. I have no idea what it is in high school baseball. It's probably something to go, do, do with going in and pulling it out. But if you're making up your mind that it's a catch when it touches the leather, then you're not seeing the rest of that information. So next time you're out there umpiring a game and the ball touches the leather and you realize that you're telling your partner right at that moment, or you're putting your arm up or you're pointing, or you're making, if, if there's no visual or verbal uh, notation, but you're making up your mind that that's a catch, that's a problem. And that's something you need to address. So we're using our eyes properly to see the entire play. So that's catches. Tag plays and force plays are kind of similar. What are we looking for on a tag play and force play? Boom, ball hits the glove in the first baseman's mitt and it beat the runner. So we're going to call him out, but what do we need to see? We need to see that that ball is possessed, firm and secure. And if there's going to be a subsequent throw, we need to see that there's voluntary release of that ball. Um, so every time we have a force or tag play, what do our eyes need to do? Go up to the glove and see that that ball is being possessed. And if, if applicable, that voluntary release. Um, and pitches, pitches, so every single umpire that's been working for more than one year has been told you have to slow your timing down, right? That's the advice we give to umpires on the plate is slow down your timing. But what does that really mean? What is having slow timing? Because if you just tell an umpire to have slow timing, they'll make up their mind and then they'll wait. They'll stand there and then they'll have that slow strike call and they'll go, oh yeah, my timing's really good because you know, my signal happens slower than it used to happen. But really all you're doing is delaying a bad call at that point. We want to have a slow process. What does that mean with pitches? It means seeing the ball all the way into the glove, making sure that we know what the catcher has done with that pitch, right? Because if it gets dragged down out of the zone, maybe we don't want to call it a strike if it was a borderline pitch. So seeing all of that stuff and then making up our mind what happens with umpires is they come into umpiring and they've been playing baseball for some number of years. And so they're used to 
being a hitter in the batter's box. And they make up their mind about what the pitch is as it's approaching the plate. And that's what happens when, when new umpires come into to umpiring is they're still officiating the baseball game. Like they're a hitter. So they're seeing it kind of approach the plate and they're making up their mind and ball hits the glove. And then we call it a strike. And over time, if they have some decent training, someone tells them to slow down, but we want to make sure that the process is correct all the way through. So that means using your eyes properly to see the ball into the glove and then making up your mind. Um, all right, moving on. So this kind of goes hand in hand with improper use of eyes, but poor signaling and the, you know, widen my angle out here, but the specific issue that I'm seeing with, with umpires is safe calls that look like this, right? So the play happens and we call call the guy the guy safe. What does this look like in a freeze frame? This looks like a time call. Okay. So this this unclear signaling, maybe it's not going to be an issue on a play at first base, right? Because if they throw the ball to first base and the runner beats it and we call this, everybody knows we're we're calling safe because it's either this or or safe. But here's when it becomes an issue. If you have an uncaught third strike and you react like this, you call it safe up here. Well, now what does this look like? This looks like we're calling time because it could be a foul ball or maybe it hit the batter. And so that's a confusing thing. So how do we fix that? We could, we could go out there and tell an umpire, you have to have better mechanics. We want your safe call right here. And that's certainly important but recognize why that's happening. Why, why is our safe call going like this? It's because we're excited. It's because we're jumping at the play. It's because our, we're letting our adrenaline drive our mechanics. And it's, I have that down there, the lightning bolt effect. We see it and we go, oh, he's safe. Like this, we get excited up here. We have to go, he's safe, now let me call it. Right, it's a separate it's a separate act of making a judgment and making a signal, and that's and that's a tough thing because there's adrenaline and there's excitement and it's athletic and you know we're wrapped up in in the excitement of the baseball game. However, it's got to be process information, use your eyes properly, see what you need to see, and then go. Now I'm going to generate some excitement by calling safe like this straight out here, or by doing my whacker call at first base but we can't have, we can't be excited. We need to be, you know, like, you know how like Terminator walks around in, in those movies, he just walks around that glassy look on his face. That's what we need to be like when we're making calls. We need to be completely devoid of emotion and excitement. And then we can manufacture some excitement with our signaling, but that's tough because you, we get wrapped up in it and it happens all the way through, but we want to work on it because we want to get better and we want to give clear signals that are understandable. All right, next thing, um, movement around the field. So let's talk about a situation where a plate umpire should be moving, should be rotating. Um, and let's, let's look at, let's just say no runners on. So our base umpire is in the A position. I'll pull up my field here. This will be helpful. So our base umpire is over here in the A position and our plate umpire is down here at the plate and the ball gets hit to the outfield. And it's, and it's one of those balls where it may be a trouble ball. It may not be. And so um, our base umpire is going to have good pause read uh, mechanics here at first base. And then they're going to decide either go out or come in. Well, what we tend to see from plate umpires is waiting around here at the plate we wait and we go, Oh man, I hope my partner doesn't go out on this ball. Right. That's a, that's a pretty common thing for us to think is like, I don't want to run anywhere. So I hope they don't go out. Well, then they do go out and we, and we say, all right, I guess I got to start running, but that's the opposite of what we want to see. What we want to see is start fast and finish slow. If you don't need to go anywhere. Right, We don't want to start slow and then finish fast because we can never make up those steps that we've lost by starting slow. So the same thing happens on rotations to third base. Um, in the two umpire system, we have multiple situations where we're supposed to rotate to third base. R1 only would be one of them. So let's talk about that. We have R1 only and there's a base hit to the outfield. Um, plate umpires tend to stand at the plate and wait to see if there's going to be a play at third base. 
right? It has to be the opposite. It has to be that as soon as, as soon as the, um, the ball gets hit, we're moving towards third base. As soon as the ball gets hit, we're moving towards third base. That's got to be our action there. And once we recognize at that point that um, we don't need to be going there anymore because there's not going to be a play, now we can shut it down. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties here. Bear with me for a second. Were there any questions so far while we're uh, resetting? Uh, no questions in the chat box yet. All right. Was there anything, anything that you guys were holding on to that you want to talk about? Any guys, any questions uh, that you guys have while he uh, fixes the computer here? Just type him in the box. All right, good. Now we're back. Sorry, there's a ton of video in this presentation, so it kind of lags on me from time to time. All right, last thing, and this was this was featured in one of our uh, one of our videos that you may or may not have shared with the group. Um, this the drifting around the plate area. So when the plate umpire is is not supposed to go anywhere, right? we still tend to see umpires that want to move somewhere out here. They want to go out towards this side of the dirt circle or maybe this side of the dirt circle. But think about it this way. If you don't have a destination to go to, right? And what, what would some destinations be? Let's think about a couple things that, that might be places we go as the plate umpire. So we just talked about a couple. We're going to rotate to third base from time to time. We're gonna um, pick up our partner if they go out from the A position. Um, we're also gonna move toward up the first baseline for ground balls to the infield when there's no runners on. Uh, when there's a tag up at third base, so fly ball with a runner on third base, we would wanna move out in this direction a little bit to get a better angle to see that tag up. So those are all things that have a destination for us. Anything else? Any other play where we're not going somewhere, literally stay still. And I know that that's, that's sometimes the hardest thing to do on the field is stay still, but that's what we have to convince ourselves of is just stay still. We, um, we need to, to maintain that position at the plate so that we can be in a spot to Take care of plays at the plate. And that's what we're going to get into now. Hey, so, uh, Brian, Brian, two questions for you on this. Okay. Uh, first, if R1 is on first, do we still trail going to third base? If R1 is on first. Do we still trail going to third base? Yes. So, all right. Talking about rotation plays, um, R1 only and a base hit that gets to the outfield is a rotation play, right? So um, the, the wording there is a bit confusing. I wouldn't say trail. What I would say is we're, we're rotating to third base to be there waiting for the play when it happens. Okay. Um, and, then, and that's kind of, that's getting into some three man stuff a little bit, but one of the things that we try to convince our three man umpires of is get to your rotations 90 90 feet ahead and I see the next comment there from Carl is mirror the runner if the ball's in the outfield and that's good but it's also dangerous and what the reason I say that's dangerous is mirroring the runner will tend to have umpires kind of waiting for that runner to go for us to go the reality is base runners are faster than us they don't have to stop right we have to slow down and stop ourselves unless you want to be the first umpire to slide into third base on a rotation play, you're going to have to start gearing down and stopping. Um, and so they're always going to be making up ground on us. So we do want to be ahead of them. So not necessarily mirroring their advance, but getting ahead of their advance if possible. In the two umpire system, it's going to be hard to get ahead of runners for the rotations that we have in the three umpire system. Now we're going to start having some, some plays where we can actually get ahead of our runner on rotations. Awesome. I um, think, uh, G. Cartanega, I think that answered your question as well. 
Thanks, Brian. Right, so we just we just finished by talking about drifting around the plate area and how we really want to stay at the point of the plate. Let's look at why, okay? Because now we're going to talk about tag plays and the wedge. And this is this is kind of the term that we've we've come up with and taught over the last I don't know eight or ten years. Um, and the wedge is going to be the 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 system that we use to put ourselves in position to see the tag as it meets the runner so what does the wedge look like it looks like us being in this position to see the moment that the tag meets the body of the runner this is the goal for every play okay in practice it looks something like this right moving into a position so that no matter when and where the tag happens, we will be able to see that. Okay, something like that. Now, we don't just pop out of the ground in the perfect spot. It takes some, some practice, obviously, but it also takes kind of following the rules and setting ourselves up for success. And some of the things that have been taught over the years of umpiring are actually kind of run counter to setting yourself up for success when it comes to plays at the plate. So we wanna we wanna start fresh. And when I talked about you know why how we teach the why, this is the why. We're gonna we're gonna break down starting position, reacting reacting to the fielder's movement, and then quiet steps as the tag develops. And talk about why we're doing each of these things. So starting position. This is our first. This is our first piece of dealing with tag plays. Where do we stand? Um, we want to have the runner sliding towards us. Okay. For it. And now let me, let me uh, put kind of an asterisk by this in the two umpire system as the base umpire, we're not going to be able to employ the wedge very often, if ever as the base umpire in our system in the three umpire system now we start to have opportunities for it but where it does show up of course is at the plate all the time for the plate umpire in the two umpire system you should always be able to do this uh in the in the two umpire system at the plate but even as the base umpire if you can't handle this play perfectly we should still have some understanding of how these plays unfold and being able to put ourselves in in the best possible spot if it's not the perfect spot so Starting position is going to be either the point of the plate or outside of the base. So if it's first or third, we'd be standing in foul territory. If it's second base, we would be in an area where the runner is sliding towards you. Um, there's some other things that we have to consider at second, but we won't worry about those right now. Um, so as the throw shortens, if it's coming from the infield, we're going to have less time uh, where that throw is in the air. We should be closer. And really, we want to be as close as we feel comfortable. So why, why is this what we're doing? Why do we want to have the runner sliding towards us? Why do we want to be closer, maybe? So if we back up, and here's where we have to start kind of undoing some of the teaching from over the years of umpiring. Because, and I can tell you that when I started, when I, even when I went to umpire school in 2009, we were taught back up to the edge of the dirt circle and then pick either third baseline extended or first baseline extended. If it was gonna be a swipe tag, you go third baseline extended. If it was going to be a collision play, you go first baseline extended. Now, let's look at the reality of that, right? So we have one umpire who's picked first baseline extended and another umpire who's picked third baseline extended. How far away are those two points? Pretty darn far. We've all stood on a baseball field. You know how far it is from one side of the dirt circle to the other. So the reality is once you've picked one of those things, which you have to do kind of early in the play, once you've picked one of those things, you're set, you're set. And so if the play changes at some point um, in a way that you didn't predict, it's really hard to make an adjustment. So why do we want to be closer and why do we want to be at the point? Well, closer makes every step we take more impactful. Okay. And that's, that's demonstrated here by this blue line and this red line. These two lines, these arrows, are the same distance. They're the same length. So they represent one step. 
We're taking one step of adjustment from the point over here. We're taking one step from the back of the dirt circle over here. Look how much more we've impacted our ability to change our angle into this play with this one step from closer versus this one step from back here. I'm sure we have a, a teacher on this uh, call that, you know, maybe, maybe we have a geometry teacher that could talk about, you know, the, the angle, the degrees in a circle and all that stuff, but I'm not that smart. So I'm just going to say the closer we are to a play, the more impactful every step we take is. And so when we're talking about reacting to a play rather than guessing how a play is going to unfold, we want to be closer um, to make sure that we can change our angle into that play. So that's starting position, closer and point and stay at the point of the plate. That's the first step in the wedge. That's a, a good place for me to kind of pause and see if there's any issues with that. Um, we try to keep these things simple, right? Stay at the point of the plate and be close. That's, that's the direction for our starting position for taking plays. All right, I don't think we have a question, so let's move on. Now here's the next part of it, our movement with the fielder. So we've started closer maybe than we used to in the past. We've stayed at the point of the plate because we're not gonna be drifting around the, the dirt circle. We're gonna stay at the point of the plate. Now, as the play starts to develop, how do we put ourselves in position to see the wedge? What do we do? Well, we want to stay attached to the fielder. Okay. We want to stay with the fielder when they move around the field. However, we don't want to react to their initial movement. Okay. Not the initial movement. We want to react to their reaction to the ball. So what do I, what do I mean when I say initial movement? Well, when the ball's hit to the outfield and there's a chance, or even the infield, and there's a chance of a runner trying to score, what does the catcher do? The catcher moves out into fair territory to set themselves up for the play. That is the catcher's starting position, just like we're taking our starting position at the point of the plate and staying closer. Once the ball is in flight and the catcher starts to react to the flight of the ball, that's when we want to react to their movement. Um, and we'll talk about why that's important kind of in our next step here. The other piece when we say movement with the fielder is don't overreact and move outside the body. So let's, let's use some visuals. So the catcher's in their starting position. We're in our starting position, closer and at the point of the plate. If the catcher goes to the right and we have a, a runner approaching from this direction, our goal is is to stay in between the catcher and the runner at all times. So we don't want to have this runner slide between us and the catcher. So how are we going to adjust to that? We're going to stay with the catcher. We're going to split the area between the fielder and the runner while maintaining the plate. We don't want to lose the plate. Now, when, when I introduced this step, I said, don't overreact and move outside the body of the catcher. What would that look like here? Well, that would look like our umpire moving outside the body of the catcher in this direction. And that's something that we're gonna see as an issue in some of the videos that we look at. So we're staying in this area where we're between the runner and the catcher um, and, and we're gonna be able to control this play. So the catcher moves forward we want to move forward and stay with the catcher so that the runner doesn't slide between us and the body of the catcher. Goes up the third baseline. We go with them. We go with them, split the runner and the fielder. Now we don't necessarily know if the runner is going to try to get around the catcher in this direction on the infield side or in this direction, on the foul side. Of course, usually it's the foul side, especially when they're coming from second base. If they're coming, uh, if it's a, a sacrifice fly and they're coming from third base, now maybe they're taking a more direct route and they might have more options to go inside. But being in this position here gives us flexibility that we can adjust in either direction, right? We can, we can move in either direction that we need to to make sure that the moment the tag happens, we can see that play. So 
One of the other ways we can describe this is stay on the same track as the catcher. If we laid down train tracks heading into whatever base we're talking about, um, you would want to be on the same track as the catcher. If you get detached and on the wrong track, now we're going to have some problems. So if the catcher moves left, what do we want to do? Let me ask you a question. If the runner is approaching from here, are we in between the catcher and the runner in our position right now? The answer is yes. So in that situation, we might not even have to make an adjustment. Um, now, if the catcher is moving more aggressively in this direction, then we would want to move a little bit more aggressively as well. However, what we tend to see, okay, and we, I, I said I want to give you something to diagnose your mistakes. Here's how you can diagnose your mistake with the wedge. If, because what our, what our umpires tend to do, what umpires all around the country tend to do is they get really comfortable going here to third base line extended because most of your tag plays these days happen with the catcher out here reaching backwards for the runner sliding in this direction. And so this becomes a really good spot that we can see that. And so um, we think, oh, I'm really good at plays at the plate. I see, I see them well all the time until it develops a little differently and our catcher goes in this direction, right? Because now the runner is going to slide between us and the catcher and we're not going to see it. So that's how you can self-diagnose. If you're just going over here into the left-handed hitter's batter's box, well, you might be getting lucky 90% of the time, but that other 10% is going to, is going to bite you. So again, we can ask ourselves if the catcher moves left and we stay right here with them, are we still on track? And I would say the answer is yes. So why does the catcher, here's the why does the catcher drive our positioning? Well, that tag is always going to come off the body of the catcher. And so we want to stay attached to them. A term that, that I've heard a lot of people use is backpacking the catcher to stay attached to them so that the moment the tag happens, we're able to see off their arm, no matter what. That's why we want to stay with the catcher. All right. Here's the last point. And I know that if you've been umpiring for a while, you've heard the phrase be set for plays, right? That's actually a benchmark of, of, of umpiring that I've heard from some very important people. They're saying, well, you are moving for that play. Um, it just bugs me because we need to be more thoughtful about it than that. Movement isn't a bad thing. Movement isn't a bad thing if it's controlled. If we're controlling our movements on a play, it's not a bad thing. What we don't want to have is we're racing into a play at the last second. That's no good. We want to, we want to put ourselves in a position where you can continue to adjust with quiet steps to ensure that you see all the critical information for a play. Um, now, there are some plays we want to be set for, right? Plays at first base, force plays. Obviously, we're not talking about force plays here. So I'm not saying just start wandering around the field and drifting all over the place. There are times we want to be set, but there are some plays that we need to continue to adjust all the way throughout their development because a tag that might start on the chest, we think it's going to happen on the front of the body, but then the catcher... Uh, has to pick a ball off a hop. And now that tag is going to get there slightly later and it's going to be on the side of the body or on the back. And the position that we would need to take for that is going to be different. So you need to be able to continue to adjust throughout the development of the play. All right. Now, after all of my uh, windbagging, we're going to look at some videos. Thank you for being patient. Now is the fun part. All right, so we're obviously watching an NCAA game. This is actually a, a regional. Um, so we have, you know, pretty good umpire out there. You don't make it to a NCAA Division I regional without knowing what you're doing. 
But let's ask, would we say this is a, a newer school thinking or an older school thinking, right? What have we done here? We've backed up to the edge of the dirt circle and we've picked third baseline extended. And on this particular play, it worked out, right? We had a tag that happened on the front side of the body. So the play cooperated and we were able to see what we needed to see. But let's ask the question, if this tag took just a little bit longer to get to the body, if this catcher stumbled while making the catch, and now the tag is gonna happen on this backside shoulder instead of on the front of the body, would we be able to make an adjustment from back here to see that tag? I can't see all of you, but I'm hoping that there's some heads going like this. Because we wouldn't, we're too far away. So that kind of that kind of starts to prove this point of we've got to be closer to plays. We've got to be closer to plays. Let's look at another one. Now we have a throw from the infield. So we're thinking be close, right? Be close because we don't, we want to be able to take that one meaningful step that's going to put us in a great spot to see it, right? Close, staying right off the hip of the catcher, being in position to see that tag. Let's look at it again. That was the only place on the field that you'd be able to get that play right. <clears throat> All right, those were two kind of swipe tag plays. So that left-handed batter's box was a pretty good spot. However, when we have the catcher who's staying in the vicinity of the plate, we don't want to start swinging around too aggressively towards the left-handed batter's box. So in this play, we have a catcher who's maintained the plate area. Maybe he just took a step to his right and is now going to reach back to his left. Let's see if we're going to be in a position to see that tag. Because the umpire didn't adjust too aggressively to his right, he's able to put himself in a spot to see the tag meeting the body of the runner, to be in the wedge, right? Look at how we're waiting here. Shoot, I think I just got jammed up here. Give me one second. Anybody got any jokes in the meantime? Santana, is our jokester Santana, you have any jokes? Why did the lifeguard not rescue the hippie surfer? Why? Because he was way far out, man. <laughs> that was actually really good. Way to go, Dwayne. Thanks for picking me up, buddy. Uh, perfect. Now we're back. So now we just saw an umpire maintain their position for uh, a play where the catcher didn't really move. Let's see some, let's see a different approach. Now what's our issue here? Because we've got an umpire here who's, gotten so comfortable with moving towards that left-handed batter's box. <clears throat> They're going to do what they've been doing all year, move over here to that left-handed batter's box, but our catcher is not going to cooperate, right? Instead of making a nice swipe tag, our catcher is going to stay right there on the plate. And if we want to talk about the wedge or the window, we want to be in an area between their body. So really that would look like staying at the point of the plate, staying at the point, staying at the point. And then when we see that it's going to be this collision type play, taking one step to our left to see this interaction 
as these two things come together, not over here with the catcher's body blocking us from the tag. Now, I see some some quizzical looks here, which I'm guessing are uh, wondering if this is obstruction. And the answer is yes, this is obstruction. Because the catcher was positioned illegally uh, throughout the development of this play and the ball, the uh, direction of the, the, the ball did not take him to this spot. He's not given the opportunity to be in that position taking away the pathway of the runner. So yes, this should be obstruction. And here's one of the nice things about the wedge theory. Um, if all of our movements are driven by the fielder, right? We're keying off of where the fielder goes. We should be watching them early. And then we're gonna be able to say, uh, all right, here's what that fielder did. They were positioned illegally before the throw ever left the outfielder's hand. So if you're positioned illegally from the start, guess what? You're gonna get called for obstruction. Or if we see that a catcher, you know, slides their body over to take away the pathway, but the throw is coming away from that area, well, now they're moving in an area to take away the pathway, not to field the ball. So having that awareness of what the fielder is doing is going to help us officiate these obstruction plays that we're supposed to call these days. Cause those are tough plays to, to call um, in real speed. All right. Here's our, we talked about, talked a couple of times about getting comfortable going to the left-handed batter's box. Here's what happens when the catcher doesn't cooperate with us, right? So if that catcher is going left, where should we be going? We should be going left with them. Now, somehow this umpire got this play right. So I guess at the end of the day, it's better be, to be a good guesser than a good umpire, but I'd rather control the play and always be in the right spot, no matter what. So here's what we see here. We see the catcher moving left, and which direction do we see the umpire moving? To the right. That's not good. We will wanna see, if the catcher is going left, we wanna see an umpire who's staying with that catcher, staying with them, so that no matter which side the tag happens, we'll be able to be in a spot to see that tag coming off the catcher's body. But when we break our relationship, when we lose the catcher, now we can't control the play anymore. The play is gonna happen and maybe we end up in a good spot, but we're not in control. All right, any intermediate questions? Nothing in the chat. Any hands? Any uh, no, no questions right now. All right, cool. All right, now, go ahead. We're good. Oh, okay, I thought I heard somebody talking. Um, so we talked about not drifting around the plate area, right? In the two umpire system, we don't want to move away from the point of the plate unless we have to. Well, here's a play that we've taught umpires to move away from the point of the plate for a very long time, but we've got to stop it. We've got to change our approach on this play. Right, so here's what we're talking about. We have runners in scoring position. We have a ground ball to the infield where the initial play is going to go to first base, okay? So they're going to attempt to retire the batter runner on this forced play at first. But either they don't complete the play or there's less than two outs to start the play. And we're going to have a subsequent play at the plate. So if, if there's any possibility of a subsequent play at the plate, do not swing around to first baseline extended here. And that's what we're going to see from this umpire, swinging around to first baseline extended and then getting caught in an area where can he see the tag? No, it's not because this umpire doesn't know how to take tag plays. It's because he's been taught to, to swing around to first baseline extended to take care of these responsibilities down the first baseline. So what responsibilities are those? It would be things like runner's lane violation, pulled foot, swipe tag, any of those issues that we're going to help our base umpire with at first base. 
But let me ask you, you, you all a question. If we stand at the point of the plate here, if we stay in our point of the plate position and we turn our body and we turn our head towards first base for, the, for all those things that are, that are gonna happen at first, do you think we can still handle those responsibilities from the point of the plate? Can we see whether a runner's running in the lane or out of the lane? Can we see whether there's a swipe tag that connects with the body or doesn't? Can we see the pulled foot from here versus here? I think yes. That's my opinion. And based on the video that we've analyzed, that's correct. We can see all those things from the point of the plate versus first baseline extended. However, if we move to first baseline extended and there's a play at the plate, we will be out of position for it. I promise you, you, you do not have enough time to go from first baseline extended all the way over here to be in the spot to actually see this tag. It's going to happen too fast. So rather than sacrificing our um, ability to officiate this play at the plate, we want to stay in a spot here at the point where we can just take a couple steps and then be in position to see that tag. Okay, so rather than swinging around to first baseline extended, we're staying at the point and we're ready to take those couple steps over here if that's how the play develops to see this swipe tag. So next time you go out there and you're umpiring a baseball game and you're on the plate and you have runners in scoring position and there's a ground ball to the infield, if you've been taught this, which most, most umpires for the last like 20 something years have been taught this, this is what we've done forever. Um, if you've been taught that, you're gonna to go to first baseline extended. What I want you to do at that point is go, oh, that's what Brian was talking about, okay? Because chances are you're not gonna get a play at the plate and so you're not gonna be in a bad position and it's not gonna reinforce that you're in a bad position. But if you can recognize that that's the mistake I'm talking about before you get screwed with this positioning, then you'll be ready to take care of it when, when it is important. So let's ask ourselves, if we swing around to first baseline extended, are we on track? Are we on the same track as the catcher or are we on the wrong track? We're on the wrong track, about to get steamrolled. This, this is a similar play, right? So initial play is gonna go to first base. Now we're gonna have a subsequent play at the plate. Look at the difference in our, umpire, our umpire's position for this one over here versus where the other one was over here, right? That's, that's what we're talking about when, it, when, when we're saying plan for that next play. Be ready to take care of that next play um, whenever possible. And that's actually a perfect time to how do I get back to uh, stop and sharing? I think on the bottom, at the bottom, you can just press stop or up top. Oh, there you go. Stop share. Yeah, yeah that button that says stop share. That's the one. Yeah. Um. So that's the wedge. Uh. I hope that that made some sense. Um, we try to keep our ideas relatively simple. So, you know, breaking it down by saying starting position, reacting to the fielder's movement, and then quiet steps gives you some, you know, simple and actionable things to do, but it takes practice. And if you've been doing something uh, one way for a long time, backing up to the edge of the dirt circle and, and you know, flipping a coin basically to say, which direction should I go? it's gonna be hard to, to, um, to switch that. Now, what I can tell you is, usually umpires have good instincts. And so even when they back up, like they've been taught, they still try to get back into the play because they can, t they can tell where the tag is gonna develop. They understand where they need to get to, but that backing up puts you in a position that it's really hard to effectively adjust for that play as it's gonna happen. So if we can eliminate the backing up um, as the first movement that you make for a tag play at the plate, you're, you're already set, setting yourself up in a place to succeed. So 
If we can just hold our ground at the point of the plate, hold our ground, and then let your instincts take over and react to the to the tag as it's about to develop, you're going to be in a good spot. But it takes it takes being harsh as your own critic because you're going to have plenty of plays that happen in a game where there's the chance of a play at the plate, but it doesn't materialize. And those are the opportunities for you to say, darn it, I backed up again on that one. I backed up again. I got to stop that. And then third or fourth or fifth time that it happens during a game where there's a runner on second base and a base hit to the outfield, then after you've made the mistake a few times, you should be saying, I'm staying put on this one, right? I'm going to stay put here. And, and hopefully that leads you into a play where you get a play at the plate and you've, you know, adapted yourself to be ready for it rather than backing up. But you've got to take stock of what you're doing on all those plays that don't materialize throughout the baseball game. Um, so that when, when they do, you've kind of rehearsed what, what it is you want to happen and you've, you've put yourself in a position to succeed. So, um, I think uh, I think that's good for tonight, right? That puts us about at about an hour. That's awesome, Brian. That's that's great stuff, man. I know that uh, you know you, you you look at this stuff and you talk about it, and it's in simple. But then the way you put it, and the way you know, we always talk, you know, between ourselves with video and and plays, and and, and it's just amazing, uh, you know, because some guys have been doing it the wrong way for twenty years, uh, and it's hard for them to adjust, um, you know, so. For, for them to, uh, you know, see this and listen to you tonight has been awesome. Uh, I do have a question, though, and I know this goes a lot on, on a pregame, uh, but we still have a lot of guys that like to rotate, like say there's a runner on second base, R2, right? Ground ball to the shortstop. And then there's the primary, there's the primary play at first base, and then now you're going to get, you know, he's out there, but then R2 breaks for third. Mm -hmm. uh, you still have a lot of umpires who like to rotate to third base on that. Is that, that is no longer a mechanic, correct? We, we no longer do that. Uh, not in NCAA baseball. Yeah. Um, I, I can't speak to what the high school mechanics manual says. I don't even know if there is a high school yeah, mechanics it. manual. Yeah. Um, uh, I would recommend against it. I mean, the reality is, a plate umpire reacting to that play in time and being able to get all the way down to third base in a meaningful position is it's just not a, it's not a spot that we're going to succeed in, especially for the, for a play that happens so infrequently. Right. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather keep my plate umpire um, home so that he can help with the play at first base. That's actually going to happen uh, rather than kind of running away. And, and what I like to think about there is, because there's always decisions we have to make. We have to weigh, like, is this better? Is this better? And, and it happens even, like, in the four umpire system. There's there's times on the field where we don't have the play perfectly covered and we have to make a decision. And what I like to think about is let's take care of the first play the best way we can. And in this case, the first play is the play at first base. That's the one we know is going to happen. And so if I put myself in the, in the shoes of a coach, right, let's say we have a, a, a swipe tag or pulled foot or something at first base on that pulled on that play. Um, and the plate umpire was running down to third base to, to take what may have developed as the play at third. Well, that coach is going to come out and say, Hey, can you, can you get help from your plate umpire? Can you get help? And now the plate umpire is going to say, well, I couldn't see it because I was running to third base for this play that didn't happen. That's tough to justify when, we know the play is going to happen at first base. So let's take care of that first play the best way we can. So um, again, whatever the mechanics manual says, I think the best thing to do is if we have a runner in scoring position and a ground ball to the infield, we're going to stay put, stay at the plate. Perfect. Um, let's see. Uh, G uh, website, do you happen to have videos on how to cover pass ball with R3 coming into home plate? If so, can we have the website address? And I think Shane put it, unitedumpires.org, Brian, is that the best one? Yeah, that's correct. Um, let me, uh, I'm not sure if we have a great video of pass balls, but let, let's, let's use what we just talked about and think about how do we want to deal with plays at the plate. So we just, we just kind of gave some tools and some guidance on taking plays and, and those those
points were have the runner sliding towards you, right? So the point of the plate keeps the runner sliding towards you. If we have a play at third base and we're in the four umpire system, if we have a play at third, runner sliding towards you, puts you somewhere out here. A back pick play at first base, runner sliding towards you, puts us somewhere out here. Well, let's not even worry about the second base. It gets more complicated. We'll be here for another couple of hours. Um, but a pass ball play at the plate, we, we have a runner sliding towards us. We want to be somewhere in this point of the plate or maybe a step or so around towards, um, towards the left-handed batter's box because where is the window that's going to happen between these two things? Right? We have a runner approaching from here and a pitcher approaching from here. That window is going to exist somewhere in this area. Okay. Maybe it's a little bit towards the north side of this. Maybe it's a little more towards the south side. But that window between the pitcher and the runner who's coming to score is going to exist somewhere in here. Um, now, what could complicate that in this case is where is the baseball, right? So if the baseball is coming from here, it's hard for us to stand right here. So in that case, we would want to stand down in this area and let the throw pass us and then kind of just step into the play right there. Just a, a nice little step to be able to see in between the catcher or, or I'm sorry, pitcher and runner as this play happens. Um, that's, what, that's what I was going to ask is if, if it's like a, a you, you're to right handed batter. So you're in the slot on the left side and that ball goes to the right. You're going to be opening your gate that way. You're not going to stay first base line extended. You're going to move back to the point of plate and wait for that play to come over your shoulder and then turn like you mentioned, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, now, that's a little different if the ball is over here or coming from straight back, right? If the ball is coming from first base line extended or straight behind us, now this area over here is wide open to you. You don't have a throwing lane to worry about anymore. Um, so we really do want to get into that position where we're between the approaching pitcher and the approaching runner. And like, you know, next time you're out on the field, go while you're doing warm up pitches or whatever, stand there and maybe do it subtly because you don't want to everybody to think you're like some tin, tin foil hat wearing weirdo, but kind of think about like, here's the pitcher, here's the, here's the runner. Stand, stand right here in the left-handed batter's box and think, here's where the pitcher's going to approach from. Here's where the runner's going to approach from. When those things come together, this is the spot I want to be at, right? And now the tag is going to change. Maybe it's more of a collision play where he gets there early. Maybe it's more of a swipe tag. And so that's where our adjustment comes in. But our starting position is somewhere in the window between those two things that are about to come together. That's, that's the goal for for a pass ball play. Um, but, you know, use those principles that we just, that we were just talking about in terms of having the runner slotting towards you and staying on the hip of the fielder. That's our goal for tag plays. And so you can use those things um, no matter how the tag, the, the play is developing. Um, huh. If it's a throw from the outfield or if it's a pass ball play. So good question. Awesome. Well, let's see, uh, we'll just take two more, uh, Brian, and then we'll let you go to bed. Um, let's see, Brian, how close to the, to the plate do you like to be for this Wacker place? Have you changed the distance you like to be over the years? Um, the, the distance I think has to be comfort level first. And so probably yes, it, uh, in terms of have I changed over the years, I probably have gotten more comfortable being closer to plays. But it's also the level of the game that, that allows you to be more aggressive, right? So I've been working some of these 16U travel games, and I started out by, like, being super aggressive and kind of working like I would a professional baseball game or a Division I college baseball game. And I realized I'm getting way too close to these plates because these kids aren't that good. They're going to throw the ball around. They're not going to make plays. I'm going to get hit. Um, you know, and it's just going to be a bad scene. So I've backed off a little bit for the level of the game that I'm working. 
Um, but if I'm working a game where I'm relatively confident in the abilities of the players, I'm going to tend to be pretty close because I'm comfortable being in the mix. Now, the only thing that's going to keep me from getting super close to a play, share the screen again, kind of figure out how to get rid of this. Uh, there we go. So the only thing that's going to keep me from getting super close to a play would be um, if we're going to have a swipe tag that's going to happen out in this area. And the reason is I might have to see the touch of the plate and the tag. So I might have to see two things kind of simultaneously. If it's going to be that swipe tag that hits, hits the runner on the back while his foot is getting to the plate, or maybe it's a head first slide. So his hand is getting to the plate and the tag is happening somewhere on the lower half of the body. If I get too close to the tag there, so I'm like zeroed in on just the tag. Now the touch of the plate is happening somewhere over here outside of my field of vision. So if I recognize that the play is going to kind of be one of those split plays where it's tag is happening here, touch of the, the base is happening over here. Now I'm going to keep my distance just a little bit more, but if everything's coming together at the plate or the base, I'm going to get, I'm going to get pretty tight to it. Um, I actually have a, hold on. I have a pretty good play. I can share with you. Think without too much delay. Give me one second. Sorry, I have like a thousand videos of umpiring on my computer, but I'm pretty sure this is recently viewed, so it shouldn't take me long to find it. And it and it kind of deals with being close to plays. You know what? I lied. I can't find it quickly, and it's going to be really boring for you guys to watch me try to find it. So. I'll send it to uh, I'll send it to Hector and he can put it up on the fa on your Facebook site. How about that? Awesome. Uh, well, Brian, uh, you know, on behalf of our, our our baseball group and our our state association, we want to thank you for uh, spending the evening with us. And uh, this training was great value for us, man. Uh, we appreciate your time, um, and we're gonna hopefully we can do it again soon. Uh, but have you ever been to New Mexico, Brian? Uh, that might be one of the states in this union that I haven't been to. So, well, Dana, uh, who is our, uh, you know, our, our state commissioner for uh, New Mexico Officials Association, and I have been talking, and we want to make sure and bring you here in the near future, man, so you can uh, train us some more and, and and spend more than an hour with us because uh, this is great stuff, and we really appreciate it. That's 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 awesome. You guys are the best. It's been my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. So when all this uh, craziness is over, uh, well, me and you will talk all the time, but we'll um, we'll make it happen. Uh, Dana, you have anything else for us tonight? No, just Brian. Thank you so much for your time, and I know it's it's late on your coast right now, so I really appreciate you staying up past what would be my bedtime uh, for sure. Um, you know, our umpires really love this, and they get a lot from it. And um, as I've mentioned to all of them, I think the most important part is just staying connected with the sport they love and, and not getting complacent during this uh, this lull. So thank you so much for your time. And, and we definitely want to have you out here as soon as things are back to whatever normal is, because I don't even know what that looks like anymore. So <laughs> I, really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Brian. Awesome, Brian. We'll talk to you soon, man. And uh, thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. It was a pleasure meeting, up, meeting you. Thank you, Brian. Good night, everybody. Guys, thanks again. Uh, Dana, we'll send out an email here uh, on our next one. Uh, you guys stay safe and healthy, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you Thanks, Hector. Bye. Thank you, Dana. Good night, everybody. Good seeing you all again. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>